So um, it's my enormous pleasure to have this little chat with Helen. Um, she needs no introduction as she's gained legendary status this year. Um, an Irish television producer and executive, Helen was RTE's first female director of TV and later director of digital television for the BBC, amongst other roles. And she recently moved back to Dublin after 30 years in London and has done some incredible things um, during lockdown, which we're going to have a chat about um, over the next little while, um, mostly about encouraging people to be kind to each other. Um, she's also just published her Stairlift Ascends book to much acclaim based on her hugely popular accounts of looking after her aunt, which we'll also get into in a bit. <laughs> I, actually, my copy is downstairs. I forgot to bring it up, Helen, but um, we've so much to talk about. So we're going to try and tear through this, Helen, and I know sure. you can do a lot of words per minute. So it's up to everybody else to try and keep up um, so that we can keep maybe five minutes for questions at the end. Um, I'm a bit of a perpetual migrator myself, Helen, um, but I have an enormous attachment to home and normally split, split my time between Cork and London. And when you live a life like that, it often comes with a slightly different perspective as you sit between home and home home. Um, how are you finding um, readjusting to living back in Dublin after such a long time? Um, initially, it was tricky, um, purely, as I called it, becoming Irish again after 30 years of being a London Irish person, uh, just purely in terms of administration, of getting all the forms right and getting the right uh, driving license and getting a, uh, a Dublin plate on my UK car um, and uh, bank accounts are relatively easy um, to sort um, and then buying the house was easy because I'd sold a biggish house in London so I had the money to not be bothered with a mortgage and so forth which is a great blessing and uh, so you know some bits that I thought would be very easy are incredibly difficult and some bits uh, that I thought would be hugely difficult um like i met the nicest well, i didn't meet but over the phone the nicest civil servant in the world down in revenue in cork who after a minion tried to charge me twenty six thousand euro to import my 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 car uh it, it being a second hand car now um uh when i rang up to plead with him and sent him a sort of three-page missive about my anos horribilis that i'd had in 2019 basically rang me and said, Asher, ah, sure, God love you. You've had a hard time and uh, basically let me off the VRT. <laughs> so um, so there's people like that that you meet. Um, so uh, when I say Anna Zaribelis, I mean, you know, that's the Queen called her horrible year when Windsor burnt down. I had um, a very difficult year in 2019. Um, a partnership, a relationship I had had for 20 years ended incredibly acrimoniously, which is not great uh, to, for one's... Um, ability to try and own, no matter how strong one is it's very difficult to to overcome that um and um brexit was the sort of was sort of changing my view on london i'd lived without any anti-irish sort of bias or any anti-irish commentary in london happily and in birmingham i see pauline roach is on who i haven't seen in years hello pauline um uh, pauline and i knew each other in birmingham um so i'd really never encountered any sort of anti-irish uh in in 30 years and then only in only since the brexit vote ha, did i notice on sort of petrol forecourts and uh in supermarkets just just you know anti-irish tone coming in um and i didn't like it you know it's what my aunt had to put up with in the 70s when when there was a campaign of course of bombs and so forth she would get she worked in the civil service in in london and she would get endure terrible anti-irish uh stuff from people she worked with so um so a little element of that, and then sadly, um, my beloved mother died at night two, uh, and she was in she was in Dublin, and I had been flying back to see her every sort of five six weeks. She had Alzheimer's, so um, when that happened, I just thought this this year can't get any worse. And I'd done all I'd done everything I wanted to do in the BBC. They were a great employer. I loved them to bits. I loved my colleagues there, and I'd kind of worked my way up. I'd been you know assistant producer, producer, director you know, had guns pulled on me by a member of the Mafia in Las Vegas, had dogs set on me. I was editor of Watchdog, the consumer show. Uh, I was executive producer. I worked on Panorama. And um, I was director of uh, 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 interactive channels when all that was coming in. Um, went back to Ireland to be to be Ortiz's first woman director of television. Um, 
and, and then was offered another bigger job at the BBC. So luckily I hadn't sold my house. So came back to the BBC to run uh, their digital channels. And then I was deputy uh, controller of BBC One. So I helped bring back Doctor Who. And it would have been a female Doctor Who had I been the controller of BBC One, but it wasn't my choice. But it, it was definitely um, down, to, down to me that I, I helped bring back um, Doctor Who, which was a favorite kids program of mine. So I'd done everything I wanted to do the Beeb. And I thought, right, okay, um, relax and go back, look after your auntie. Um, her sister, my mum, had died and uh, she was now 89, 90. Uh, and of course, all this predates COVID, which uh, so I was happily, slowly getting used to living back in Ireland and then COVID hit and there's a new chapter there. Yeah, I mean, you've definitely not been idle. Um, and it seems you seem to be like a bit of a one woman whirlwind when it comes when you've set your mind on something. And um, there was your local support initiative, which started with Samantha Kelly, then Ireland keeps going website. People should check it out if they haven't seen it um, based on your tweets about nice places to visit in Ireland and your nightly retweets, of course, kind of supporting by Irish and all that. And that's over and above the book. Um, what motivates you, Helen? And where do you get your drive and your capacity to get stuff done in jig time? Um, you know, where does that come from? And if you could also speak a little bit to the power of networks and community based on your experience and how, it's helped, how it has helped you to achieve that. Uh, well, I have I, been so lucky to have worked with particularly really good women, actually, from the time I started in RTE after university, um, people like Bibi Baskin, um, Olivia O'Leary, I worked on a program called Today Tonight, which is the forerunner of um, primetime. So I had wonderful, strong female um, colleagues, uh, and, including the marvelous Nulo Fuelon, and her exhibition is still on at um, Museum of Literature in in um, in Dublin, uh, which is well worth going to see. Uh, and she was one of my mentors as well. Um, so going up through the ladder as well, I had great, <coughs> excuse me, female um, leaders including the controller of BBC One, Lorraine Hegesy, uh, including Anne Robinson, the famous Anne Robinson, um, who was is as scary on screen as she is off screen, um, and who basically, you know, was the first female tabloid, uh, editor of a tabloid on Fleet Street, which is no mean feat. Um, so all of these women have taught me to, you know, demand an equal salary, demand the equal space to be heard, to be listened to at meetings, uh, not to be the shy retiring violet at a, you know, sixth floor TV center, mostly male executive boardroom meeting. Um, and I have to say that's where the Irish accent comes in, came in very handy actually, because you weren't, they couldn't place you because you weren't an Oxbridge type. So they haven't got you down. They haven't got your seed breeding generation. So they couldn't really place me. So they all showed up and listened, which is really nice. Um, but uh, so it was, uh, you know, the fair few men in there were fantastic as well. And, you know, I had to endure um, a pretty rotten time in a couple, a couple of places. Um, I'm gay. I had, I had uh, some serious homophobic stuff to deal with at RTE when I went back to be director of um, television there. Um, I could tell you some stories that would, you know, you wouldn't believe actually, including having my office broken into so somebody could steal a picture of my partner and photocopy it and leave it in toilets um, by a senior manager, by the way, in RTE. So, you know, this, you know, it, it, there's extraordinary stuff that you have to put up with and then you have to do your day job, which they should be doing as well. But so it's, um, you know, I've had hard knocks as well. Um, and my resiliency comes from my mum. She was an extraordinary character, strong character. Uh, never saw me as anything less than my, my brother had been very successful in medicine and I didn't want to go into medicine. I didn't want to have to follow him. So I, I, I went completely the different way into sort of arts and media uh, and was always treated with the same respect by my mum. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just so she she has been my central core and and then I've been lucky to have more ladders than than snakes, shall we say. 
Okay, sounds good. I mean, Awaken Hub, as you know, is a community of uh, women founders and those looking to kind of change their lives by running their own business. And I mean, you know, you come across as, and I know, look, thing, you know, there's a soft side to all of us, right? So, but you come across as being like pretty fearless and, and a trailblazer um, and you've held these high pressured jobs and roles and stuff, um, kind of pioneering all the way. I suppose any advice for some of the fabulous women in our community who are looking to make major life changes or career changes or probably, I suppose, a mixture of both, you know, one kind of inspires the other. So, you know, what do you know for sure? Or what, what little bits of advice could you maybe give to some of the people? I, I think you, I mean, you really have to know, I mean, this is the first time in 30 years I've, you know, I've worked in public service broadcasting. So it's, it's been safe for me. I had a permanent pensionable job. So I'm not going to lecture people or I'm not easily going to lecture people who are setting off to do their own thing and be entrepreneurs and have to rely on their own money for things. I was in a very well paid, very nice, soft, cushy, pen well, not cushy, but, you know, hardworking, but pensionable job, which has allowed me in my early 50s to pr pretty much, if I wanted to, retire. So, you know, that that's me. I mean, you know, I put in the hours from the from the from the age of whatever I was, 22, when I went into RTE first. And now at 55, I'm I can be retired. I don't want to be retired, hence all the initiatives online and doing the book and so forth, because I want to keep my brain going. And I will, in fact, be looking for to, to go into maybe um, CEO of a charity or something like that. I don't particularly want to go into broadcasting again. I might continue to do a bit of journalism. I write, might write a piece of fiction. And that working in working in a pet, working um, the life I have had has allowed me to now have the freedom to choose. OK, so I don't want to be in a position of saying to all these women, who maybe have a nest egg of money or something oh yes you must do something about it i only know how to work so far in in a massive public service broadcaster where everything i need is at the other end of a phone or at the other end of, a, of the computer um and there are people who will get things for me and run you know twenty-eight thousand people in the bbc you can ring up and get the correct pronunciation of a word you know that's not the same as running something from your back bedroom you know so um you do have to you do have to uh trust yourself and your once you know you can put in the hours when it's necessary um then i think you know you you can embrace things but you also have to know when and, and rely on other people to tell you that it's either working or it's not working because if there's if they're yes people you know, I've realized that pe pe friends can be great and say, oh, aren't you marvelous and do this and do that. But sometimes it's completely alternative views you have to listen to. Um, and they may be sharp and they may cut you, um, but they might just alternate your course, even by a few degrees, um, to put you on the right path. So listen, listen to the dissenting voices has, has been very helpful for me. You know, I didn't always think I was a good director or a good executive producer and you know people particularly in the media said oh yes but you're fabulous you did so well and you want this and you know some of my best people and people now that I miss are the ones who said Helen you you've duplicated you've gone off beam you've lost a little bit of your edge here and they were the ones who were right actually so that's my own experience that's yeah, my yeah. own experience. and then i think that's a very valid because i mean we often want our egos stroked and being told we're doing a great job but that's not always to our benefit you Absolutely. know it's not going to necessarily yeah. necessarily get us to where we where we want to go yeah. um like i feel like our lives have been on a bit of a twin track we spoke about this um last week ever since i found you on twitter um around the time your mum passed away because my mum had um I had uh, dementia as well and she died a few months before your mum did um and then you move home uh, to mind your aunt a single lady professional glamorous educated uh, clear of mind strong of spirit and not afraid to speak her truth 
um, I was cocooning in Cork during lockdown one with my mum's only um, sister um, and I had the pleasure of kind of keeping her safe um, at home in her last few months before she passed away. And Mary was exactly the same. I mean, I just like literally felt like somebody had moved, you'd moved inside my head, you know, and, and you could see everything yeah. that was going on. The boldness, as I used to call it, I mean, bold, like wasn't the word. Yeah. Um, the stair lift used mainly for like her handbag and the laundry. Um, yeah. rem- reminiscing on her world travels the enormous capacity to remember stuff like it makes me think I need to go on a brain training course for the amount of stuff I can't remember um and um watching Love Island and Naked Attraction were two highlights for us (laughs) trying to explain them to you know an 80 year old woman Uh, and the whole who touched the thermostat discussions Mm. as I literally was passing out with the heat um which all kind of culminated in a zoom call I had with my um, Awaken Hub co-founders wearing one of Mary's cotton tops and it was like waking up in a in an episode of Golden Girls in a bad dream or something because I had only winter clothes with me when we started and then it was getting warm so like what you've done with Stairlift Descends I mean it, you, like you've captured the hearts and minds of people and you speak to anybody and I think especially this often falls to women you know more so than to men in terms of the kind mm-hmm. of carer situation so I know you're going to read um, a couple of your favorites in the minutes but I mean if you were to think of one or two things that you've learned from your mom and your aunt like what would they be um always wash the bins out very important (laughs) uh don't let the neighbors see that you've got dirty bins that seems to be huge okay Okay. uh and um basically um always plan a trip to arnett's once a week okay they're important in serious trouble if you if you don't take them to arnett's once a week Okay, we'll um, put that on the to-do right list. About the, I mean, the other thing is what I what I regarded is because she obviously of her of her age, um, she she had to go into a cocoon and she's very she's size eight, svelte, she fits into anything. She's just amazing and she's fabulous into fashion and so forth. And uh, but she is fragile and um, and I also had double pneumonia a few years ago, so I'm have to be careful of my health too. So we were in a cocoon basically. So my world from being sort of London and the Great Show Club on Friday evenings turned into Rush Village on North in North County Dublin. The village, the pharmacy, Price's Euro Spa, and the beach for a walk. That was it, you know. That was my my whole day. And basically, the microcosm turned into banter, and the banter between my aunt and I kept us alive, really. And she kept me alive as much as I did. I mean. My whole life, as, as everybody who's an entrepreneur around here will know, is about their interactions on the phone or Zoom or anything. And um, it was just the wonderful, maybe it was my ear because my ear hadn't been so attuned to the Irish language in so long. I mean, language as in the way we phrase it and the cadences. And she'd no filter. She didn't, yeah. she didn't, she didn't mean to be cruel, but I missed, I missed that sort of hilarious. My mum my and her, used, we used to, my brother and I called them the chipmunks. Because they just, every time you met them, they just sort of bantered at each other all the time. There was no, it was like, cha 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 So we called them the chipmunks. He'd say to me, how were the chipmunks this weekend, you know? And I realized that was keeping them alive. So this, this is, I mean, this is one of the ones I've quoted quite a lot because this is almost, this is how it started, really. Um, she, I heard a shout from, uh, she was in the front room looking at the telly. I was in the back room on Twitter. And she, I'd write down, aunt shouting loudly from front room, Helen, Helen, me, drops everything, rushes in, expecting to find her flat out on the floor, and sitting comfortably with one of my London cats on her lap, looks sweetly at me and says, can you get me a little Jemison? You know, I mean, that's the type of thing your mother, you know, your mother, your aunt, your grandmother, I could have, I could have bashed her over the head with it, you know? And also when we went out on an Arnott's trip, and she got a few things and I went off to the lingerie department that she was browsing and we got home and we had the bags piled up. We really bought a few things. And she poked, she poked my bag. She said, what'd you get there? And I said, I got a couple of pairs of sloggy knickers. And she just looked me up and down. She went, I didn't know they did them in your size. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, you just think, now she didn't mean it cruelly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just that she just, that's the way she comes out with things. And you kind of allow it with your mum and they're so alike that she's just like that too. So you have to have 
your guard up. And if you read these, I mean, I come off worse. That's that's to be honest. This is people saying, oh, are you not making a joke out of your poor 90 year old? You want to bet. Read this. It's me as the butt of jokes to her. And she gets a great laugh out of it. Now, I get a great laugh out of it, too, looking back, you know. I mean, it's like it's classic shopping trip to Grafton Street. Uh, we're exhausted. Car is this is this is so true. Car is parked right out St. Stephen's Green. It's because she has a disabled badge. So there's a perfect spot just outside the St. Stephen's Green on the top of Grafton Street. We're walking back slowly to us. Me carrying two heavy bags of Marks and Spencer shopping in one hand and hanging on to me on the other. And lets out a huge sigh. Me, what's up? And oh, it's all too much. I'm never doing this again. You know, I mean, and me just absolutely flat sweating, you know, and her getting the, the coffee and the everything. So it's those little sort of, you know, just funny chats, funny things that keep you going. And something will trigger you, you to think, my God, that's my auntie, my granny, my sister. It doesn't matter. You know, sometimes age doesn't even come into it with what she's doing. But when I asked her way back in April, could I put these up? on Twitter or Twatter as she calls it, she calls it Twatter. Um, she said, so long as there's no photographs of me and you don't give my name. So I said, no, that's absolutely fine, no problem. So when, it's fi when it finally became the book and became a reality, um, the Irish Times sent a photographer and uh, she said, he's taken a photograph of you and my, and, and my stair lift. And I said, yeah, why am not I in it? I said, because you wanted to be anonymous. And she said, oh, she said, I'm not, not letting you have the limelight. So up she climbed on the stair lift. And then he has to, you know, he takes the photo. And then he said, can, I just need your name just for identifying purposes for the, for the archive for the Irish Times. So I said, can he use the name in the article as well? Oh, yes, Monica. So she's now Aunt Monica. That's her name, Aunt Monica. The anonymous is gone. Yeah. And her photograph has been in the Times. And just to let you know, she is like a child with a stardom at the moment. I can imagine. Have you laminated the picture yet to step yeah, in the front door? No, I, I went up there today because we were having the, st the stair lift was actually getting a makeover. The people who installed the stair lift insisted it's about 15 years old and they were so chuffed with the stair lift becoming the most famous stair lift in Ireland. They sent lovely, a lovely guy up to, to fix it. So I went up and I said, is there going to be a Hollywood star on the back of it, you know? Um, but uh, she's like a child at the moment. And she's shown it to the milk, shown the article to the milkman and the book, to the milkman and the postman, and everybody's coming. And it's taken years off her. So um, she keeps on saying, how much have you made on this book? And I said, well, you don't make much on books, on royalties in Ireland. She goes, would you get me a winter coat in Ireland? <laughs> So she's, you know, the brain is still ticking over, you know, but that's it's been great fun for a mad, weird year. Yeah, this has yeah. been such a lovely little end chapter. And the book was never planned, never planned. They were just a series of tweets until lovely Ivan O'Brien from O'Brien Press said, listen, Helen, if you can get me the tweets and the wonderful, just so you know, Neve Geraghty, who sent me this actual embroidered Stairlift Ascends logo, and I had it on my mantelpiece in my house in Dublin, just a little summer gift. I threw that into the envelope and literally flung it out the window at Ivan in Rathgar because we had to socially distance, and he flung back in a contract. It was the maddest publishing deal ever, you know? Mm -hmm. So now it's flying off the shelves, and there you are. That's, yeah. that's the story. So of we've done a little poll, Helen, while you were chatting away 90 to the gallon there about whether we'll have our second breakout room or not and okay. overwhelmingly people have decided they want to go into the breakout room no I'm only joking <laughs> they want to stay here with you so it gives us a little bit more time because we we were running over and we, we like to try and stick to time but um so what I'm, I have one more question for you and then what we're going to do is maybe um hand over to the floor and and ask people if they if they have a question um, that they'd like to put to Helen no 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 we're great we have like another maybe um, five minutes, Helen. So um, um, I suppose what's next for you, Helen? And is there anything we as a community can do to help you? Um, I, to be honest, I don't know. Um, I might like, I started doing some articles for the Irish Times, uh, mostly actually when I was house hunting uh, in their um, Saturday section. Um, I'd like to sort of pursue maybe taking that up again. COVID hit, which put pay to anything like that. 
Um, I mean, obviously, a lot of journalists are, are have been furloughed in, in this time, so maybe not the best time to go back into journalism. But um, I, I have a few ideas for, for fiction, yeah. which I might do. And uh, I've been approached by a few places to go into broadcasting again, but I've kind of been there and I don't know if I can face all that again. So but yeah, we'll see. I gave myself a couple of years. Yeah. It would take a couple of years to come back, settle down, mm -hmm. do a garden, which I've absolutely loved. And my aunt has really helped me with that. She's a brilliant gardener. And then, no, of course, nobody planned for COVID. So we call, we've all been on hold, really. So hopefully next year, things will start to open up. Things will get back to normal. And, you know, fingers but, crossed, vaccine and everything, we will yeah. have a, another new start next year. But I'm fine doing what I'm doing. I'm re back reading books again, which I never had a chance to because I worked so long and so hard at the BBC. I have books up to the ceiling in the front room that I have to plow through. So I'm in my elements, you know, and Good. I'm looking forward to it doing a great Christmas dinner. Excellent. And hopefully you might, you know, become a little regular attendee. We'd love to have you with us and anything we can do along the way when you figure it out. To, to help you, we, it would be our pleasure. So um, I suppose the easiest way we can do this is, is if anybody has any questions or want to answer a question, can you put your hand up? Um, and um, Jackie, Jackie has a question there. Yeah. Jackie, okay, so if you want to unmute yourself, Jackie, and... Uh, I'm so okay. sorry, I was literally like, oh, it's, it's we're literally putting our hand up. Um, yeah, I'll keep it really quick. Helen, I mean, I'm just blown away because my background's in media, I study journalism. I went into RT, I ran out of it because I found it quite, I was, I don't know, I felt that there was a little bit of bullying at the time, very male dominated and yeah. stuff. I was like, oh my God, where was Helen? If I had a bit of um, a role model at the time, maybe to be a bit more confident and stuff like that, that story is amazing. But Perry and I just, so we're just, we also were carers for our granny. So the yeah. two of you so enjoyed that conversation because we feel like, you know, the elderly people are sort of, I don't know, they're left aside a little bit in society. And I would love to see more people understand the wealth of joy and wisdom and everything that they bring and, and whatever. But from a personal perspective, I was just going to ask you, did you find a big difference between RTE and the BBC? Because I've had friends who worked in the BBC and they seem to have an entirely different perspective. And do you think things have kind of improved now for women, I mean, in terms of being able to rise up the ranks in the media in an institution like RTE, I guess? Yeah, I mean, I think I think things have certainly changed. Um, RTE, when I first joined, it was a complete male bastion. I mean, I mean, there's elements of it were there when I came back to to uh, run TV section there, and it was horrendous to witness because these guys had basically vied with each other for the same jobs, and they were like battle scarred, and they were determined to take it out on everybody and anybody who came between them. There was just a cadre, of, a small cadre. <coughs> really boring middle-aged men to be honest and um you know they would do anything to keep people from being creative and uh you know I won't, it, it's a while ago now RT has changed i know i, I know because i've still got some great friends in there i think d forbes has been fantastic i was approached to be uh director general at the time she she took it and i just there's no way after what i put up with as director of television, would I go back as director general? Because if, as I knew from the time, the first per, the first time I was there, one person, no matter woman or man, one person cannot change an institution. Yeah. Indeed, as you have pointed out, you ran you ran out because you thought it was too much bullying. You have to have and create a, a levels around you of support, and they have to be absolutely tried and tested. And not again going back to the same thing: not yes men and not yes women. Mm. And I had that in the BBC. Listen, the BBC is not without fault, as we've seen over the last couple of years about equal pay and so forth, and the way that Carrie Gracie was, was affected on BBC News and her payments and so forth. So it's not without fault. Um, but, you know, I needed Anne Robinson, for example, to tell me how to negotiate my salary. When I went to, do, to edit a certain programme, they offered me let's say it was 75,000 sterling, right? This is a good few years ago, right? Yep. And, and then I was like, oh, that's, mm, that's quite, that's not bad for, you know, 1997 or whatever it was. And I was thinking, oh yeah, that's right. And the previous guy had been, it was a man, of course, previous guy had been a man. And me, Egypt, thought, okay, yeah, I'll take the job. And Anne Robinson rang me. She said, how much do they offer you? And I said, 75,000. She said, you know, X, we'll call him, was on 120. And I went, what? <laughs> she said, for, this, for doing the same thing that you're about to do. 
And I say, you are having me on. And how she knew that, she had her, you know. Anyway, so, no, so I went back to them. I said, no, I'll do it for 125. Um, and they hummed and they hawed. And I got my 125. Thank you very much. But that, you know, I would have taken it for 75, you know. So th that's the thing is, now I had connections. I had the network. And I had somebody in very strong position, namely Anne Robinson, who, by the way, was on about a million, you know, just <laughs> compared to what I was on, you know. But that just shows you that you need that inside information. You need that network. And usually, in my experience, it was women who would tell you these things. Someone to turn to. Yeah. And I yeah. think that's why this community is important. But that's amazing. I didn't really. There was. So I used to work in the Late Late Show, for example. There were five researchers, all female. There was a male exec, male director, male presenter, male floor man. Like everyone in the in the, the, the powerful sort of roles yeah. were male. And we always found it difficult to get, you know, if we had, if there was a guest we would be interested in hearing. It's like, oh, that's for women. You know, literally that was almost yeah. said. And you're yeah. like, but <laughs> we're not 50 percent of the population. Yeah. Yeah. But there was a hierarchy. You, there was nowhere to go, really, with with any sort of issues so I think just listening to how you rose through those ranks you must have been a trailblazer and a ball buster and just gone for it and I'm just super impressed Helen honestly I'm like yeah. thanks Jackie um we've time for just one more sorry Helen sorry Sinead just so you know you just called me a ball buster there's more truth in that than because once in the today tonight office you'll enjoy this one I was a young young trainee well I was a researcher in the today tonight office and there was lots of parties. The green room for today, tonight, yeah. i.e. where we'd bring all the politicians and everything was right beside it. And there'd be loads of drink after every ep episode. And there was one producer who was a bit notorious. And he basically got me up against a wall. This, I was only 22, 23, right? And was trying his way, you know, one night late. And I need him in the balls. So, you know, and that <laughs> basically... So I have actually busted balls. Okay, girls? Good. So Okay. Okay, noted. There is mind. Noted, Helen. Okay, <laughs> on, um, Helen. Have, have we time for one more question? Pauline, had you wrote had you your hand up? No. Anybody else? Any hands? Ah, you are all scared. You are all scared. They're they're feared. They're feared of you, Helen. Now they know what you're oh, capable of doing. Like formidable women, there. Go on, put your hand. Oh, up. Oh, sorry, there. Caroline. Caroline Regan, do you want to unmute? A quick question out of mind, please. Thanks. Just unmute, Caroline. You unmute. See, Pauline Caroline. Logan has her hand up as well, so maybe we could take a quick question Ooh, from sorry. Pauline as well. Pauline? We... Who was it? Sorry. I said Pauline Logan had All her right. hand okay. up, so maybe we've got okay. time for two. If people don't mind us going over five minutes, then we'll do that. Caroline Regan, you're up there. Helen! Helen, I'm in New York and I follow you on Twitter all of the time. And I know that you help people with little shout outs. Yes. My nephew, when he was three, got cancer and he was in Crumlin. And he and his two friends are doing a TY project and they have rebuilt a 1954 tractor for, and all the proceeds are going to Crumlin. But with COVID, they can't get too many places to sell tickets. So okay. if you could give them a little shout out, I'll, it's, it's a oh. simple hashtag. I'll send it to somebody to share it with you. Sure, sure. No problem, Caroline. Thank you so much. Thanks, Caroline. They're going Pauline. to be on Nationwide. Okay, great. Bye. <laughs> bye, bye, bye. Pauline. Hi, I was just going to say, sorry, I, I say this to Helen every so often on Twitter, but I think you could do a brilliant podcast. Like, I think you've just got such a perspective and, uh, you know, you, so much, so many interesting people that you could bring in and you, have, you know, you bring your perspective to them. So I keep reminding you, I think there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of podcasts out there, but there aren't actually that many really strong uh women-led ones in ireland as far as i know at any rate so you know i encourage you again you. I'll, I'll consider it i was on a good one recently uh that Eam mccormick runs called the kish podcast i did that a couple of weeks ago and that's that's developing quite nicely as well um so i'm actually in, in my the woman who was director of radio when i was director of television um helen shaw um Athena Media. She does the um, she does the Pantasocracy program on RT Radio One and so forth. She does great courses in podcasting, and I'm down to do um, one with her in um, in January. We went for a wander around uh, Farm Lee, the lovely place in Queens Park, a few weeks ago, and we caught up. The strangest thing was we never knew when we were at RT together, and she was running radio and I was running television. We've both gone to the same school in Holy Faith Convent, Glasnevin. She was a couple of years ahead of me. 
So talk about all the people, the, the stuff about Southsiders running RTE. We were like the two girls from the North Side running RTE at the same time. So um, yes, I will. I'll really bear that in mind, Pauline, about um, the podcast. And uh, you'll be sick of hearing from me. Keep an ear out. Brilliant. <laughs> Okay, well, look, folks, we have um, a couple of minutes left. Helen, again, thanks. You know, Thank you. you know, girl fan, you know that and everything. So um, looking forward to meeting <clears throat> you in person one of these days. Um, so